Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Lezek, Coordinator of Special Projects with the Adult Services Department. And on behalf of everyone at the Chicago Public Library, welcome. Tonight's program is part of the 2020 One Book One Chicago season, exploring the theme Beyond Borders and the book Exit West by Mohsin Hamid. For more information on other virtual programs, including book discussions, author events, workshops, and more, visit onebookonechicago.org. If you're interested in tonight's event, I'd especially recommend our Mijente Net Latinx Poetry Salon coming up on October 7th. Again, full details are available on this and other events at onebookonechicago.org. Thanks to the Chicago Public Library Foundation, Bank of America, Union Pacific, and United Airlines for their support in making this season of One Book One Chicago possible. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by CPL's Latinx Heritage Committee and presented in honor of Latinx Heritage Month, and we're thankful for their support into making tonight's happen. During tonight's program, we'll be monitoring the chat for questions from the audience for our Q&A portion of the evening, so please feel free to ask one. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome Jose Oliveras to CPL's virtual stage. The son of Mexican immigrants, Jose's debut book of poems, Citizen Illegal, was a finalist for the Penn Gene Stein Award and a winner of the 2018 Chicago Review of Books Poetry Prize. It was named a top book of 2018 by the Adroit Journal, NPR, and the New York Public Library. Along with Felisa Chavez and Willie Perdermo, he is the co-editor of the anthology Latinx. In 2018, he was awarded the first annual Author and Artist in Justice Award from the Phillips Brooks House Association and named a debut poet of 2018 by Poets and Writers. In 2019, he was awarded a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the Paris Review, and many other places. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome Jose to CPL. Hello, everyone. My name is Jose Guadalupe Olivares. It is an honor to be here with you. I wish we could be together in person, um, but I'm happy that we can get together uh, in whatever ways we can. So I'm gonna read a bunch of poems for you and then afterwards we'll get a chance to have a conversation. So please, if you have questions, you can post them in the chat and then Jennifer um, will pass them to me during the Q&A. Um, Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you to the Chicago Public Library for having me. Libraries were one of the first ways that I got connected to literature. So uh, I love libraries. I deeply believe in libraries. And I always feel very grateful whenever I get to do an event with the library, especially the Chicago Public Library. Um, so this first poem is called Mexican American Disambiguation. It's after a poet named Idris Goodwin. Um, who's from Detroit, but spent a long time in Chicago. Mexican-American disambiguation. My parents are Mexican, who are not to be confused with Mexican-Americans or Chicanos. I am a Chicano, which means I am a Mexican-American with a fancy college degree and a few tattoos. My parents are Mexican, who are not to be confused with Mexicans still living in Mexico. Those Mexicans call themselves Mexicanos. White folks at parties call them pobrecitos. American colleges call them international students and diverse. My mom was white in Mexico and my dad was mestizo. And after they crossed the border, they became diverse and minorities and ethnic and exotic. But my parents call themselves Mexicanos who again should not be confused for Mexicanos living in Mexico. Those Mexicanos might call my family gringos, which is the word my family calls white folks. And white folks call my parents interracial. Colleges say, put them on a brochure. My parents say, que significa esa palabra? I point out that all the men in my family marry lighter skinned women. That's a Chicano in me, which means it's a fancy college degrees in me, which is also diverse of me. Everything in me is diverse, even when I eat American foods like hamburgers, which, to clarify, are American when a white person eats them and diverse when my family eats them. So much of America can be understood like this. My parents were undocumented when they came to this country. And by undocumented, I mean sin papeles. And by sin papeles, I mean royally fucked. 
which should not be confused with the American dream, though the two are cousins. Colleges are not looking for undocumented diversity. My dad became a citizen, which should not be confused with keys to the house. We were safe from deportation, which should not be confused with walking the plank, though they're cousins. I call that sociology, but that's just a Chicano in me who should not be confused with the diversity in me or the Mexicano in me who is constantly fighting with the upwardly mobile in me, who is good friends with the Mexican American in me, who the colleges love, but only on brochures, who the government calls non-white Hispanic or white Hispanic, who my parents call mijo, even when I don't come home so much. Thank you. So um, this next poem that I'm going to read is called, I Love the World So I Married It. This is a poem that I wrote thinking about that, uh, that phrase, maybe you remember it from your childhood, but when we were kids, we would make fun of people by saying, if you love it so much, why don't you marry it? So this poem is called, I Love the World So I Married It. <sighs> Music. Even on the day my grandma died, there were mangoes, though I tasted nothing. But slowly I came back to the world in carne asada, better than I remembered, smoke off the meat. I couldn't contain my happiness, even though it felt offensive to smile with my grandma buried and getting eaten by the flowers. And sometimes I look at my love and think I would like to stay to put a welcome mat on our doorstep with our names hyphenated. When I was young, I believed in forever. Then my uncle died and I knew forever included none of my family, included no friends, their stories rotting in my head until I lose them again. So I know I will divorce the world and let it keep my most treasured possessions. A six piece with lemon pepper and mild sauce on, all the honey of a slow kiss, my Apple Music playlist, the way mi abuelita smiled and called me Lupito. I hated that name, except when she said it. Cool. I like reading that poem when I'm doing Chicago events because in other places around the country, people ask me to explain what mild sauce is and with the Chicago audience, I don't have to explain it. So uh, it's nice to be understood is what I'm saying. This next poem is called Getting Ready to Say I Love You to My Dad, It Rains. Um, some of you in the audience may also be Mexican. As it turns out, uh, Mexico is the place that most Chicagoans, it's like the most common descendancy for Chicagoans is Mexico, right? So some of you might also be descended from Mexico, in which case uh, you might understand what I mean when I say that I grew up with a Mexican dad. Uh, and in part, for those of you who are not Mexican or not Chicano, what I'm saying is my dad showed us that he loved us, you know, by making sure that the bills were paid, making sure that we had food in our house, but he wasn't the most, uh, verbally effusive lover, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I wrote this poem trying to imagine what a relationship might look like between us that was a little more outwardly loving, right? So this poem is called, Getting Ready to Say I Love You to My Dad, It Rains. I love you, dad, I say to the cat. I love you, dad, I say to the sky. I love you, dad. I say to the mirror, it rains and my mom's plants open their mouths. My dad stays on the couch. Maybe the couch opened its mouth and started eating my dad. I love you, dad, I say to the couch, its tongue working my dad like a puppy. I hear the rain fall and think the city is drinking or making itself clean. I am here with my dad and the TV and the TV drones on and on so I'm not sure I hear it. My dad grunting and nodding, not the mushy stuff I was expecting. Neither of us cry, no hug or a kiss, just a grunt and a nod. I love you, dad, I say to my dad. 
We sit together and watch TV. Outside it rains. My dad turns the volume up. The city is drunk. The city is singing badly in the shower. I killed the plant once because I gave it too much water. Lord, I worry that love is violence. My dad is silent and our relationship is not new or clean. I killed the plant once because I didn't give it enough water. My dad and I watch TV on a rainy day. We rinse our mouths with this water. Cool. Um, I'm gonna read one more from the book and then I think I'm gonna read a couple newer poems and then I'll come back to the book. Uh, this next poem is a poem that I like to read because I wrote it kind of like as an act of rebellion. This poem is called Note Vaporu. And I wrote it because uh, growing up, I read a bunch of books. Like I, sp like I said, I spent a bunch of time in libraries and in all of the books that I read, I never saw any of the characters mentioned Vaporu and it always struck me as unrealistic. How could all these great books not mention Vaporu when Vaporu is the most common medicine was like one of the earliest medicines that I remember. Um, so Vaporu, you know, if you know, you know. And if you don't know, I think you can get it by the context of the poem. Um, and I'll tell you afterwards. This is called Note Vaporu. Vaporu is pronounced Vaporu, like loud or chew. The label for Vaporu says it's for cough suppression. But in my house, Vaporu is for headaches, sore muscles, nightmares, and everything else. Put some Vaporu on my dad's diabetic toes and watch the sugar evaporate. Miss a day of church? Put some Vaporu on your forehead and watch forgiveness flush your cheeks. Put some Vaporu on our bank account and watch the bill collector stop calling. When I forget a word in Spanish, I take a teaspoon of Vaporu under the tongue. So that's that poem. If you didn't figure out what Vaporu is, in English, it is pronounced vapor rub, but its real name is Vaporu, it's Vaporu. So uh, now you know. Um, I'm gonna read a couple new poems. Like I said, my name is Jose Olivares. Thank you so much for being here. Um, because this is a, actually I'll read this one first. This poem is called Ars Poetica. And if you're not familiar with poetry, in Ars Poetica is kind of a fancy way of, you know, writing your poetic mission statement. So this is kind of like, this is my poetic mission statement, Ars Poetica. Migration is derived from the word migrate, which is a verb defined by Merriam-Webster as to move from one country, place, or locality to another. Plot twist. Migration never ends. My parents moved from Jalisco, Mexico to Chicago in 1987. They were dislocated from Mexico by capitalism and they arrived in Chicago just in time to be dislocated by capitalism. Question, is migration possible if there is no other land to arrive in? My work is to imagine. My family started migrating in 1987 and they never stopped. I was born mid-migration. I've made my home in that motion. Let me try again. I tried to become American, but America is toxic. I tried to become Mexican, but Mexico is toxic. My work is to do more than reproduce the toxic stories I inherited and learned. In other words, just because it's art doesn't mean it's inherently nonviolent. My work is to write poems that make my people feel safe, seen, or otherwise loved. My work is to make my enemies feel afraid, angry, or otherwise ignored. My people are my people, my enemies capitalism. Susan Sontag says, victims are interested in the representation of their own sufferings. Remix, survivors are interested in the representation of their own survival. My work, Survival, question, why poems, answer. All right, so there's that poem. And then this is another new poem. 
Uh, and I don't usually read this one, but because this is for the Chicago Public Library, I'm going to read it. This poem is called Wherever I'm At, That Land is Chicago. Um, and I wrote it while not living in Chicago. Uh, so, you know, Chicago's one of my great um, inspirations for sure. So I wrote this poem, Wherever I'm At, That Land is Chicago. Forgive my geography. It's true I'm obsessed with maps, with flags. A Starbucks on the block means migration. Any restaurant with bulletproof glass is a homecoming. Underneath my gym shoes is a trail of salt. That last sentence is a test. Does the poet mean A, grief, B, winter, C, diaspora, D, this is the wrong question, E, all of the above. I'm always out south of somewhere. I know the sun rises in Lake Michigan and sets out west. I got primos I've never met. There's a word for that. Where did they go? All the steel mills are shuttering up like conquered forts. One day, there will be an urban tour through South Chicago. Picture the soy cappuccino sipping cool kids wearing Chicago over everything, branded hoodies, taking selfies in front of machines that once breathed fire, pretending the bones are the real thing. Cool. So that's that poem. I wrote that poem because I wanted to write a poem with gym shoes in it, uh, which is another piece of like Chicago language that is not everywhere. Um, let's see. I think the next poem, so I grew up in Calumet City, Illinois, which is the south suburbs of Chicago. Uh, if you've never visited, I highly recommend that you visit. Um, you can go to a place called Panos, which has really delicious gyros and cheese fries. Um, I don't know if it's actually really delicious, but uh, I'm very nostalgic for it. So in my mind, it's, it's very delicious. I'm gonna read this poem, uh, this poem, I wrote this like another Chicago poem. I wrote it when I was homesick. It's called Ode to Cheese Fries. Ode to Cheese Fries. Golden goo of artificial delicious will probably lines my stomach with sunlight grease for weeks after eating the yellow, so yellow, it could only be manufactured. So what if it's fake? As much cheese content as Apple Jolly Ranchers. I come from a city of foreclosure, foreclosure, empty lot, city where we got dollar store brand action figures. So what my Wolverine doesn't have retractable claws or the right uniform. So my joy at Panos, my favorite fried everything spot, the cashier's voice, a box of Newports filtered through throat. I didn't know I would miss this home where the patties come from freezers and maybe not ever from cows or even animals. I live in a city that brags about its organic quinoa fed beef. Of course, I miss the 90s pop playing in the restaurant, the Backstreet Boys live in Cal City where the band never breaks up. The song plays on repeat as the cashier takes my order. Say it with me, cheese fries, please. Give me everything artificial including cardboard fries, the bread fresh out of a Walmart cloning experiment, throw in a cold pop. I want a joy so fake, it stains my insides and never fades away. Cool. Um, let's see, I read one poem from my dad, so maybe I'll read uh, a poem that I wrote, mostly inspired by my mom. Um, this poem is called, I Tried to Be a Good Mexican Son. It's a true story. I, I tried and stay trying to be a good Mexican son. I tried to be a good Mexican son. I even went to college, but I studied African American studies, which is not the law or medicine or business. My mom still loved me. So I invented her sadness and asked her to hold it like a bouquet of fake flowers. She laughed through it all. I didn't understand. 
Wasn't immigration a burden? What about the life you left? I asked my mom. She planted flowers. Only house on the block with flowers. Foreclosure came like a cold wind. It took her flowers. But that was a season. New house, bigger garden. Mijo, go get some tomates from the yard is something my mom really says. I tried to be a good Mexican son, went to a good college and learned depression isn't just for white people. I tried to be a good Mexican son, but not that hard. Sometimes my mom's texts get dusty before I answer. Even worse, I never share the Jesus Christ memes she sends me on Facebook. If there's a hell, I'm going express. I hope they have Wi-Fi. I hope I remember to share my mom's Jesus Christ memes. Maybe God believes in second chances, but I doubt it. I tried to be a good Mexican son. I came home for the holidays, still a disappointment. No million dollar job or grandkids, Spanish deteriorating, English getting more vulgar. I tried to be a good Mexican son, but I kept fucking it up. My mom still loves me, even when I can't understand her blessings. She makes me kiss her on the cheek before I leave the house. She tells me to quiet down when she's watching her novelas. She asks me if I'm okay. She tells me I'm getting so skinny and I need to eat more frijoles. She has the pot ready. I try to be a good Mexican son, but all I know how to do is sit down for a good second and leave before a bad one. Cool. Once again, thank you for tuning in. Um, I have a few more poems to read and then we can have a conversation. I'm really looking forward to reading your questions. So if you haven't already submitted them, by all means, please do. Um, so this is another poem that I wrote. Uh, well, so this poem is called You Get Fat When You're In Love uh, and it's a true story. A lot of my poems are true stories. You get fat when you're in love. You got a little extra love on your ankles. Love hanging over your belt line. Love makes it hard to fit inside your pants sometimes. Love got you buying bigger sizes. Need deeper pockets for all this love. Your buttons can't hold all the love rippling up the middle of your rib cage. Love turns those shirts into accordions. You make music with this love. Carry yourself like a song. When you get skinny, everyone rushes to compliment you. They want to know what your secret is. Tell me, they say, what's your secret? You look great. Call it the broke heart diet. Love left you, then you left you. Now all you have is this disappearing body. Thank you. I'm just pretending that wherever you're at, you're clapping. So thank you. <laughs> um, I wrote that poem inspired by uh, a friend of mine was making fun of another friend and uh, said basically like, you can always tell when, uh, when our friend was in, was in a relationship because he always got a little bit chubbier and you could always tell when the relationship ended because he, he would slim down a few sizes. Um, so shout out to my friends for being uh, very funny and a little bit mean. The name of this poem is, My Family Never Finished Migrating, We Just Stopped. My family never finished migrating, we just stopped. We invented cactus. To survive the winters, we created steel. At my dad's mill, I saw a man dressed like a Martian walk straight into the fire. The flames licked his skin, but like a pet, it never bit him. In the desert, they find our baseball caps, our empty water bottles, but never our bodies. Even the best ice agents can't track us through the storms. But I have a theory. Some of our cousins don't care about LA or Chicago. They build a sanctuary underneath the sand, under the skin we shed, so we can wear the desert like a cobija, under the bones of our loved ones, bones worn thin as thorns to terrorize blue agents. 
bones worn thin as guitar strings, so when the wind blows, we can follow the music home. Thank you. All right, let's see. I think I will read two more. And again, if you haven't gotten your questions in, um, please get them in because I would love to uh, talk with you about whatever you want to talk about. The title of this poem is WAPO. I start with my feet because I hardly ever look at them to say hello. Hello, left foot. Hello, right foot. I give my feet my favorite name, the name my mom gives me when she brags to relatives. Get waples, I say to my best kick, my awkward dance partners, my friends in almost catching the beat. I move up through the hairy terrain named my legs. Wapple, I say to moonlight skin. Heartbreaker, I say to my thighs, ass, and dick. My lover took all her pet names when she left. My name doesn't belong to her now. I poppy, I say to the scar on my belly. I only knew my name when it came out of her mouth. A hey, shorty, what it is, I say to my freckled chest, to the red bumps I used to hide under t-shirts, ugly as all hell, but all mine. My chest so pale, it glows in the dark. Wapo, I say to the lanterns I carry, my red beard. I give myself all of the names I like. Young Joselito, Papi Churro, Lupe. Shout out my hair while I still have it. You can see that this was written a few years ago. Shout out, let's see, where was I? Shout out my hairline and how it makes me look like my dad. My face I got from my mom. We look the same when we are laughing. Wapo, I say, it is my new name. It is my old name. It is my only name. Cool. Thank you. So I'm going to read one more, and then we'll have this conversation. And uh, I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you again to the Chicago Public Library for hosting me. Um, this poem is called Poem Where No One Is Deported. And this is another new poem. But you know, since the theme is beyond borders, uh, I think it's only fitting to end with this. Poem where no one is deported. Now I like to imagine La Migra running into the sock factory where my mom and her friends worked. It was all women who worked there. Women who braided each other's hair during breaks. Women who wore rosaries and never had a hair out of place women who were ready for cameras or for God, who ended all their sentences with si Dios quiere, as in the day before the immigration raid, when the rumor of a raid was passed around like bread and the women made plans, si Dios quiere. So when the immigration officers arrived, they found boxes of socks and all the women absent, safe at home. Those officers thought, no one was working. They were wrong. The women would say it was God working, and it was God. But the God my mom taught us to fear was vengeful. He might have wet, wet his thumb and wiped La Migra out of this world like a smudge. This God was the God that woke me up at 7 a.m. every day for school to let me know there was food in the fridge for me and my brothers. I never asked my mom where the food came from, but she always told me, gracias a Dios, gracias a Dios del chisme, who heard all La Migra's plans and whispered them into the right ears to keep our family safe. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Thanks so much, Jose, that was great. And thanks to all of you uh, for being here. If you have a question, do put it in the chat and we're gonna get to a few of them right now. Um, we have a question from Sue who says, do you write one poem until you finish it like you would write a novel or do you write multiple poems at the same time? That's a great question. Um, I just had my light fixture fall down. Okay. So that's why it got dark. Live TV. <laughs> yeah, live TV. Listen, welcome everybody. Um, 
I, I tend to write multiple poems at once, but it's never, it's never really my plan. So I start out and I have a seed of a thought or an emotion or an image. And I try to write that poem. And what happens is as I try to write that poem, my, my brain naturally processes things very linearly. And so what happens is I'm trying to write this poem from the top to the bottom and I'll have interrupting thoughts and I'll write them down to the side. And then those become other poems. And oftentimes the interrupting thoughts are, um, are poems that I end up liking more than whatever the original idea was. Interesting. Yeah. That I, I feel like I've heard other writers say the same thing sometimes that they're their tangents end up being what the book actually ends up being about. Um, exactly. Kathleen asks, what does your writing process look like? Do you have images before you write or do they come to you as you write? Right, so it, it kind of depends on the poem or the piece of writing. Um, I wrote a pro, like a kind of an ode to Mexican grocery stores for Chicago Magazine earlier in the year and that one started because I, I knew that the expectation was that I would write about the products inside Mexican grocery stores. And I wanted to find a way to write about the people inside the grocery stores. Um, and so I knew going into that, that I would maybe start by placing people in the room by naming some of the products, but that I would try and turn towards the people. Um, other times it's kind of like I told you, right? I write, I have a phrase or a word that's stuck in my head. Um, I read a poem just now that had the word cobija in it, right? Cobijas are, are like uh, Mexican blankets. And um, so I wanted to write a poem that, you know, shouted out cobijas. And then I had to build kind of this structure, this poem to house that word. So sometimes it works like that. Um, so yeah, I usually have some kind of, see of an image or a thought or a phrase or language that I try and then spin into something else. Great. Um, this is a great question we have from Rocio. What is your favorite topic to write about and what topic is the hardest to write about? My favorite topic to write about, um, I don't know if I have a favorite topic to write about. I think I think I have a favorite approach to writing whatever it is that I'm trying to write about. Um, so I'm always trying to find a way to be subversive in some way. And when I say subversive, I both mean subversive to my own understanding. Um, and then also try to understand how, you know, if I'm starting with an image, what is the resonances, the textures that the image has beyond myself so that I can understand how to play with those like inherited understandings to try and dig some new meaning into it, right? Um, I, I would say of the topics that I tend to write about the most, probably identity and family are the two that I come back to the most. Um, and then in terms of like the, the topics that are hardest for me to write about, um, I love love poems and I love reading them and I write a whole bunch of them, but I'm not very often very successful. Um, so uh, I, I, have a, I have a hard time writing love poems of all types, even though I try, I really do love love poems. That is funny, right? Because you always think of all poets are just romantics. <laughs> um, I have a couple more questions here too. How did you decide to write poetry as opposed to writing short stories? Did you ever want to write anything else? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm actually working on a short story right now and I really do like the form. Um, I, I kind of think I got into poetry at first as just like a coincidence. I grew up in Calumet City, Illinois, like I told you, and I attended our public high school there, TF North, uh, shout out District 215, go Meteors. Um, and we just happened to have a poetry slam team at our high school. And that mm. was kind of the first mode of writing that, you know, teachers offered up to me as a way of 
telling my own story as opposed to, you know, we, we were always writing paragraph essays or book reports, but very rarely, especially, um, I mean, I, I'm not that old, but even back then, very rarely did teachers ask us, you know, to, to kind of bring our own expertise to the table, right? Um, and so poetry was the first medium where I was given that opportunity. And I think if it had been short stories, maybe I would have, you know, dug really deep into short stories. I think if it was essays, maybe I would have dug deep into that. But for me, it was poetry. Um, and since then, I, I mean, I, the reason I continue to write poems is because it's really challenging. And I also love the fact, like I said, I'm writing a short story right now. And even short stories, you know, it's hard to finish a draft of a short story in a day. Whereas like a poem, I can end the day with a new draft or maybe even two on really good days. So I like, uh, I like kind of giving myself that challenge. I like having a short amount of space, but trying to maximize the impact. Um, and did I miss any parts of that question, Jennifer? No, you got it. You got it. Okay. You, I just want to tell you, there's a lot of shout outs to Cal City in the comments too, which is- Oh, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> Excellent. Shout out to Calumet City, River My, Oaks Mall. Right? <laughs> My dad is also from Cal City. He may also be chatting there <laughs> and saying that. Um, do you have okay. any words of advice for aspiring poets? So my words of advice for aspiring poets are, you know, one, to read as much as you can. Everything that you read becomes inspiration for the things you write. Whenever I get stuck with the writing project, I know that I can always read and be given an idea for how to approach whatever my writing problem is. So read as much as you can, read broadly, um, because you never know what might give you inspiration for what you're working on. Um, and then my other piece of advice is uh, to try and find a community to be part of. So like I said, when I was a teenager, um, I plugged into the youth poetry community in the Chicagoland area at Young Chicago Authors. And for me, that was really huge. It meant that when school was not in session, I could trade poems with other teenagers. Um, and get a little bit of feedback and start to build my confidence. I was really shy as a teenager. So in part, that was how I overcame my stage fright was because, you know, I had the, the, the knowledge that my peers already liked the work at least a little bit, or at least they were telling me, right? So um, to me, those are the two, two pieces of advice that I would give. That's great advice. Um, do, how do you get past writer's block and what do you do when you come to an obstacle? Right, so when I come to writer's block, when I come to an obstacle in my writing, I, I just sometimes, I mean, I'll try to write through it because I think a writer's job is to sit down and write. Um, but sometimes we just might not have the answers that we need to, to solve that problem. But what we can always do is we can always read. So if I get stuck and, you know, you can see in my background that I have a, a bookcase there. There's a bookcase in front of me that I look at. So I'm always, you know, I try to read whether it's poetry or fiction or, you know, nonfiction. I always try to like read something to see if I might solve my problem that way. That's, that's really great. Um... Who are some other, this kind of goes along with that, who are other Latinx poets that you find interesting? Ooh, this is a great question. <laughs> other Latinx poets. Um, so immediately there's like a few Chicago poets that come to mind. Uh, there's a poet named Jacob Saenz, who's really great. Um, he's from Cicero. Uh, Erika L. Sanchez, uh, who you're probably familiar with is really excellent. Um, she's also a poet, really lovely. I really like her poems. Um, there's a poet named Vic Peralta Chavez, whose poems I really like. Um, they're really great. They don't have any published books yet, but you can find a few of their poems online. Um, and then more broadly, there's a poet in Fresno named uh, Joseph Rios, whose book Shadow Boxing is really great. Um, there's a poet named Vanessa Villarreal, uh, whose book, I think it's called Beast Meridian. Um, I might be blanking right now, but that book is really great. 
And let's see, there's a poet out of LA named Janelle Pineda who has a chapbook coming out with Haymarket Books that is excellent. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and then I feel like I could go on forever. <laughs> Raquel Salas Rivera is really good. They're a Puerto Rican writer. Um, Malcolm Friend is excellent. So is Yesenia Montilla. Willie Perdomo is kind of an OG. Uh, so there's, I think there's tons of really excellent Latinx writers right now. And this is a good opportunity for us to plug again on October 7th, uh, we'll be having an event with the uh, Mejente Latinx Poetry Salon. So tune in to this YouTube channel for that at six o'clock on October 7th. Our website has the details on that. We have a few more questions. Um, Rosa asks, you mentioned South Chicago, although you didn't grow up there, what parts of the Southeast side influenced you and your poetry? Right, so when my parents first moved to Chicago, they moved to South Chicago. Um, like I said, my dad worked in the steel mills and we, the first few years of my life, we were living um, in South Chicago. Like one of my earliest memories is going um, to church on, on La Comercial and then going to McDonald's afterwards. Um, so that was one of the reasons why those years stayed with me is because when we moved from South Chicago to Calumet City, um, we went from living in, you know, basically a totally Mexican neighborhood to a neighborhood that was at first predominantly white and then kind of transformed over the years. So that by the time I graduated from high school, Calumet City was, you know, majority Black American. And then probably the second and third populations were tied between uh, Mexican people and white people, right? So um, that kind of movement was like the, it, it felt like a very important, it you like those first few years, if you would have told me that like Chicago was a city in Mexico, I would have believed you. Like I lived my whole life speaking Spanish. I didn't speak English. Um, and it, just about everybody that I met and knew was Mexican. So anyway, um, so those, those types of things were important to me, but then also we, you know, Growing up in Calumet City, we often visited friends and family members. My grandma lived in South Chicago for a long time. And we off, like we would go to church there. We would go to parties afterwards. So I spent a lot of time there, especially early on, um, even though we weren't living there anymore. Great. Um, Marlon's asking, have your parents read your poems, especially the ones about them? Yes. So. My parents have read, like they, they own my book and they've read them to the best of their abilities. Um, one thing that makes it hard is, you know, neither of my parents are native English speakers. They, you know, they were both born in Jalisco, Mexico. Um, my mom still doesn't really speak a ton of English. Um, my dad speaks and, and reads and writes English a little bit better. Um, but, you know, we talk about the poems and I, I always try to make sure that before I publish anything, especially if it's about them, that I show it to my brothers and that I talk with them because my, you know, I'm not writing to try and hurt their feelings and I want them to be proud and know that, uh, that I see, tr that I try to document like our joys as well as our hurts, right? Like I try to remember that, you know, life is complicated and full of ups and downs. And then also I try to remember that, you know, I'm me and my brothers are not necessarily the center of their universes, right? Like my parents um, have rich interior lives and some of that has nothing to do with us. So I try to take that into account when I write poems about them. Do you ever write poems in Spanish? I have written some poems in Spanish. Spanish was my first language, but uh, I basically went to school in all English. So I don't have like the best kind of artistic flair with Spanish. Um, so I do write poems in Spanish sometimes and I've tried translating my own poems, uh, which is a cool exercise, but it's something that I hope to do more of in the future. Cool. Um, we have another question that's, uh, what do you think is the role of the poet uh, or poetry in times of trouble or challenge like we might find ourselves in today? Yeah, that's a good question and one that I've received a lot. We 
are often in times of great urgency. I would say that we are always in times of great urgency. It's just what makes this feel a little bit different is that more people are kind of privy to how urgent times are. But there's always, you know, if you ask people who were homeless in 2006, they would tell you 2006 was urgent, right? So there's mm -hmm. always people um, who experience that urgency, right? So we're always living in urgent times. I think the role of the of poetry and art in general um, is, I would say a few things, right? One is maybe to show and remind people that we are in urgent times. And not only that, but that we're not powerless in these moments, that we have choices to make every day and that we can cho make choices to kind of bring about the world that we want to imagine. Secondly, I would say that, you know, uh, Tony Cade Bambara has this incredible quote that I always return to, which is the role of the artist is to make revolution irresistible. Mm -hmm. And I love that because I think it's true, right? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the ways that art can do that is by helping us to imagine different possibilities. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that we don't need to turn just to artists and poets in that way. I would say that uh, the people that inspire me, like I was reading about, I mean, he happens to be an artist, but there's a rapper named Femdot uh, who after Chicago Public Schools announced that they were stopping their free lunch program, he decided to start delivering groceries to needy families on the South and West sides, right? So I would say, you know, the role of the artist is also the role of everybody, which is that we have to take a role in our collective fight towards liberation and helping each other, right? And so if that means writing poems, then that's what you do. But if that means delivering groceries, then that's what we do. And so I think all of us need to ask ourselves in what ways can we contribute to that push? That's great, yeah, wonderful. I think we've made it through all of our questions here today. So uh, thanks so much for everyone who tuned in tonight. And uh, this will be available on demand to watch on YouTube. So if you had a friend who missed it, tell them they can watch it on demand. And thanks again, Jose, this has been really wonderful. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you to the Chicago Public Library. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Shout out to Calumet City, shout out to Chicago. And uh, yeah, oh, if I'll just say real quick, um, yeah. My book is on sale right now through Haymarket Books. I think it's 40% off. So if you go to haymarketbooks.org uh, and search for my name, you can get my book on sale or you can get it from your local library. Listen, whatever you'd like to do. Thank you so much. That's great. Everyone have a wonderful night and don't forget to join us for future One Book, One Chicago programs. Check out the schedule and everything we got going on at onebookonechicago.org. Thanks so much.